our monthly top 10, I wanted to do one on a bunch of different RPGs. I love RPGs, more specifically, I love JRPGs. I get lost in them and I'll play them for hours on end. But then I was approached by Square Enix and they asked me if I wanted to talk about the new Dragon Quest Heroes 2 game by sparking up a conversation about Dragon Quest. The idea of talking about Dragon Quest was genuinely really appealing to me, and coincidentally enough, I have been marathoning them for the past few weeks in my personal gaming life, and they said that I could make any kind of video I wanted, so I thought, this is kind of the perfect synergy just to make one big top 10. So, full disclosure, this video exists and is brought to you by Square Enix's Dragon Quest Heroes 2. Dragon Quest Heroes 2 was made together with Omega Force and Koei Tecmo as the second in their series of spin-off games based not only on Dragon Quest, but the Koei Tecmo Battlefield Hack and Slash series, Dynasty Warriors. Imagine the simple class-based RPG system of Dragon Quest, but combine the big battlefield, hundreds of enemies, and sweeping objective-based maps of the Dynasty Warriors series. The game's been out for a few days now, and for me personally, I've been frustrated because I've been wanting to talk about it, and I've had no one to talk about it with. As you'll see in a second, I absolutely loved the first game in this series. And now that I've already sunk a sizable chunk of time into this new one, the big thing I'm noticing now is that on top of transposing Dragon Quest's simple yet satisfying RPG systems seamlessly into Dynasty Warriors combat style, they've also brought the whole thing out into a massive open world map. And it's filled with cool secrets, mini medals, places to grind, chests to loot. You take all of this and then all of a sudden you feel alive in the world of Dragon Quest again. And even online multiplayer now. So with that said guys, I'm going to be playing this game a lot in my own personal life for the next few weeks. If you guys want to play with me, leave your screen names for PSN in the comments below and I'll pick a couple of you guys to join me. Once again, thank you to Square Enix for supporting us and this is so, so cool. Dragon Quest Heroes 2, available now. As a disclaimer within that, this top 10 amongst all my top 10s are my opinion and my opinion alone, no matter what anyone says in the comments. So be assured that what you're about to see are my, in fact, top 10 Dragon Quest video games, including spin-offs and side series all along. So with that said, let's get started. For me, Dragon Quest has always kind of been like the Beatles, where you always know they're really good, and they basically laid the groundwork for everything in the genre that came after. And then, every couple of years, it finds a for real way to sneak back up on you. And after listening to that song for the fifth time, it sounds like you just fell in love with it for the first time. I might not have grown up with it like some of you have, but I love the Dragon Quest series dearly, and I'm super excited to share that love with you now. This is gonna be like a nostalgic burrito that I couldn't finish myself because I already had a big breakfast this morning. Come on guys, share with me, have a bite. Dragon Quest straight up earned all the status it has righteously just because it's always been such a well-made series. And yet for some weird reason, in the West, it's never really enjoyed in that same level of success that it has in Japan. And honestly, I can't for the life of me figure out why. With that said, I present to you my top 10 Dragon Quest games. Some of these games, while they may not be considered a part of the main Dragon Quest franchise, are considered spin-offs, and so you might see a few of them here on this list. Hopefully, this list of mine is going to inspire some of you to finally go out and try some of these games for yourself. So I'm not going to talk that much specific about plot points in this list to avoid spoilers. And honestly, I probably wouldn't even really want to do that anyways, because that's not really what Dragon Quest games are all about in the first place. Instead, I'm going to focus on what makes each game so damn fun. And hopefully by the end, you'll be psyched for Dragon Quest Heroes 2, and maybe later Dragon Quest XI, as I am. And remember, for whatever reason, my opinions might be slightly different than yours, and that's okay. So instead of raging at me like my opinions matter more than any other bearded dude on the internet who makes videos about video games, just let me know what your opinions are in the comments below. And be classy, or no puff puff for you. Yeah, that's right, you know the deal. Boobs. Talking about boobs. It's a... It's a Dragon Quest thing. Alright, let's go. Number 10! Now, this one is a pretty weird one, so I'll stick it right there at number 10 to get it out of the way. 
Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime is a freaking cult classic DS game that has no business being as good as it is. And also, it's a rare example of compelling and solid gameplay being completely complemented and enhanced by a unique yet still simple premise and a wonderfully silly localization. No one really knew they wanted a quirky Dragon Quest action-adventure game, especially one about how the lovable yet very wimpy slimes get bullied by absolutely everyone, including their co-workers and fellow monsters. But that's what we got, and gosh darn it, it's a beautiful and perfectly polished little portable experience unlike anything else out there that was in 2005. And that sort of bouncy, squishy way everything moves will forever be filed in my own personal r slash oddly satisfying subreddit of the soul. Essentially, all of the slimes mysteriously disappeared from the land of slime mania, and it's up to you as Rocket, a lowly slime himself, to traverse through the levels in a top-down action-adventure style to get them all back. The mechanics are based around this awesome, stretchy charge attack you can do to move yourself and objects around. There's plenty of stuff to do and collect, and as you rescue more and more slimes, you rebuild your home city of Boingburg and take on the nefarious Plop Cartel. Add in the impressive looking giant tank battles, which really put a unique spin on the idea of collecting loot by making you use it as ammo, a solid Dragon Questy soundtrack by Koichi Sugiyama, and a bunch of clever environment puzzles, and what you end up with is one of the DS's true hidden gems. Now just to be clear, even though this game also has Dragon Quest heroes in the title, it has pretty much nothing to do with the series we're promoting today with Dragon Quest Heroes 2. I mean, sure, that version of Dragon Quest Heroes also has a cute relatable slime for you to fall in love with in the form of Helix the Friendly Heal Slime, but that one's a dope PS4 hack and slash, and this one's just a precious old DS game. So again, no relation. Just don't play it unless you already plan to finish the whole thing, because if you're anything like me, you will not be able to put this bad boy down. If you ever see this game at a con or at a game store, grab it, no questions asked. You'll thank me, I promise. Number 9 not surprisingly, the first main series game on this list is a big one, and with 5 of the 11 classic characters in Dragon Quest Heroes 2 coming straight out of Dragon Quest 4, I can tell a lot of Dragon Quest fans out there will probably agree with me. Dragon Quest 4 was the first game in the series to not be set in the same timeline as 1, 2, and 3. And I have no way of confirming this, but it seems like from a story perspective, they really took that concept and ran with it. Instead of starting Starting out as a hero and picking up party members along the way, Dragon Quest IV spends four of its five chapters introducing you to each party member on their own separate adventure. And in a weird 16-bit Quentin Tarantino-esque move, they all team up with the hero in the last chapter to finally take down the big bad, in a conclusion that feels much more like a bunch of well-told story threads coming together than the last three games ever did. I bet this seemed pretty crazy at the time, but Dragon Quest IV is truly a second wave RPG. And nowadays, not only this, but the game brought a whole bunch of firsts to the franchise, from choosing specific characters for battle to programming your partners to follow basic tactical instructions. They have rippled through the genre and become not only commonplace, but practically expected nowadays. And all this extra time the game makes you spend with each party member leaves you feeling much more connected to them by the end of the story. And for the completionists out there like me, this was also the first appearance of mini metal quests. And when I turned on Dragon Quest Heroes 2 and see Torneko Taloon scrounging up a deal, or Maya and Mina swearing vengeance for their father's killer, and I'm collecting those mini medals there too, I just gotta smile and remember how great this game truly was. But I will say, the NES version is great and all, but the DS version, Chapters of the Chosen, which is also on cell phones now apparently, is definitely where it's at. A whole other chapter, a whole other character, better graphics, more interesting dialogue, and more control over your party in the final chapters? Sign me the F up. The F is for four, that is. Dragon Quest IV, Chapters of the Chosen, which I chose to be the number nine in this list. Get it? Hey. All right, moving on. Number eight. Sometimes I think that dragon questiness must be some kind of real life version of fairy dust. 
where you just sprinkle it on stuff and everything becomes magical. Because in a world where it seems like every franchise and their mother is getting their own Dynasty Warriors spin-off these days, Dragon Quest Heroes manages to stand out purely because it's so pretty looking, so deliciously fanservice-y, and just well designed overall. It completely reframes Dynasty Warriors combat into what basically otherwise feels exactly like a straight up main series Dragon Quest RPG. And the inclusion of awesome next gen versions of some of the series most beloved characters is just icing on the cake. You play as the main character, you're tasked with having to save the world, you gain party members along the way, you grind, take on side quests, and search for the secrets on the road to getting the best gear, skills, and filling out your whole giant quest log. The original characters in this game are still designed by anime and manga icon Akira Toriyama, who you may have heard of already. But just like in the second one, when all of your favorite characters from across 30 years of games show up, and not only do you get to have them in your party, but control them directly, it's like a greatest hits version of the main games, where battles that you take turns having in an RPG get sped up into real time so you can fight crowds of fan-favorite monsters at a time. It's been a while since we've gotten a new main series game to chew on out here in the West, and when this game came out, I had no idea how perfectly it would scratch that itch. And it didn't hurt that the game looks absolutely gorgeous either. In fact, up until we get Dragon Quest XI, hopefully sometime this year, this is the best Dragon Quest has ever looked. And it's crazy how many aspects of past games, from mini medals to character classes to the alchemy pot, worked so well in a game genre they never were intended to be a part of. It's awesome. Plus, I loved the king in this one. I mean, look at that dude. Who can even look at him and not be like, yo, this guy is awesome? Not me, that's for sure. And I know, I know, I'm getting paid to promote the sequel and promote it I shall, but if you love Dragon Quest and you haven't played this game, all marking aside, where have you been? This game is awesome! And as someone who got the second one early and spent hours and hours grinding classes in its giant open world, I'll tell you right now, it's even better than the first one. Seriously, I put a ton of hours into Dragon Quest Heroes last year, and I'll probably do the same with its sequel. Number 7 a lot of people love to call games in this side series derivative, and I guess they're not totally wrong. Everything is inspired by something, but a lot of people don't realize that ever since Dragon Quest V, which came out in 1992 by the way, collecting monsters to use as members of your party has been an off-again, on-again feature of the series ever since. And while Dragon Quest Monsters Joker isn't the first time they decided to make the whole game about that, that was actually the original Game Boy Dragon Warrior Monsters, which features a kid version of Terry from Dragon Quest VI and Dragon Quest Heroes, and that's also pretty good too. But it was the first time that it really felt clean. As usual with the Monster series, gameplay revolves around convincing monsters to join you, training them up, and eventually synthesizing them into other monsters as a form of breeding, which is really what I come to the table for in Dragon Quest Monsters, but I like this one the best. Maybe it was because it was the first DS Monsters game, or maybe it was because Dragon Quest VIII was up in the air and the franchise was kind of experiencing a little renaissance at the time, but Joker just feels really fresh compared to the previous games in the series. Now I know this is probably the one entry on this list that seems the most out of place, maybe just because there's so many good Dragon Quest games, and this one's a little bit lesser known. But there's also a feature in the Dragon Quest Hero series called Monster Coins, where you can basically pick these coins off of monsters you've killed and recruit them to help you out as support moves or friendly NPCs. As a huge fan of the monster spin-offs, this excited me to no end. But I was kind of bummed when I found out that you couldn't actually play as the monsters too. But now they've gone ahead and added that to Dragon Quest Heroes 2. My nerdy little DS playing younger self watches me running around and punching dudes as a golem. And he's smiling, giving me a big ass thumbs up like, yeah, dude, we're finally doing it. And then he kickflips away into the sun. I don't know why he kickflips into the sun or even the fact that he did that. That was dumb. I don't even own a skateboard, you guys. Number six. When you choose to play a JRPG, what you're really signing up for is this giant sweeping journey full of adventure and epic battles, where you can disappear into the world for hours at a time and be rewarded with quantifiable character growth for the time that you put in. Most games deliver on this for about 40 to 50 hours, and then once you beat the final boss, devolve into mindless grinding and repetitive side questing and mini games, that comes out to another 60 to 70 hours. 
Dragon Quest 7, however, delivers on that promise for all 120 plus hours. And with its clever world expanding premise and incredibly versatile class system, which makes each quest almost feel like its own little bite sized game within a game, you can play this game and only this game for an entire year and never get bored. Of course, nothing is perfect for the very first time, but whereas the PS1 version suffers in the graphics department and with the pacing at points, the 3DS remake we got last year largely corrects these missteps with little time savers like moving from random battles to enemies you can actually see on the map and a huge overhaul to the opening chapters. It provides a more cohesive, solid version of a very important entry in this series, which especially doesn't get as much love as it deserves in the West. And as a completionist, games that continue to feel like they have new things to show you right up until the very end are pretty rare in my book. Also, it's super awesome to see the bratty mayor's daughter Maribel and Ruff the Wolf Boy in Dragon Quest Heroes 2 since they were in my Dragon Quest VII party pretty much as soon as I was able to use them. Dragon Quest VII has this great sort of casual quality to the characters, and as you collect more shards to open up more and more of the world, the 3DS version adopts the more recent tradition of giving the inhabitants of each island a slightly different regional dialect. It gives you a better sense of the world having different cultures, and in a game as large as this one, seeing all the private problems these people have makes the entire world feel fleshed out in a way many other huge games don't. In Dragon Quest Heroes 2, this tradition continues with some unreasonably good voice acting. It was practically just as exciting hearing Maribel and Ruff as it was seeing them, and the different accents for the different cultures holds up pretty well here too. Like, am I crazy or is Carver freaking Canadian? I know he's from Dragon Quest 6, not 7, but whatever, it's kind of awesome. Well then, you better let us tag along for the ride. Can't stay holed up here in the forest forever, huh? Hardcore RPG fans should pick up Dragon Quest 7 right away if they can, but make sure you've got some time to kill, because with a class system as deep as this one, which you don't even unlock until about, you know, 25 hours in, you're probably gonna need it. Or you could just get Dragon Quest Heroes 2 instead, which has a much more manageable class system that you can fully complete in less time. As a completionist myself, sometimes the easier path is ultimately the more enjoyable one. Sometimes. Number five. Despite the fact that most Westerners, including myself, probably bought this game mostly for a crack at the packed-in demo for Final Fantasy XII, Dragon Quest VIII sort of became a sleeper hit among people who weren't even really looking for it. It looks beautiful. It was truly the first game to show Dragon Quest in 3D, and it has a really enjoyable, straightforward plot and simple yet rewarding gameplay. Essentially, a king and his daughter are turned into a troll and a horse, and they team up with one of their guards to rescue everyone else in the kingdom, who's been turned into plants. It doesn't sound super serious, I know, but then again, Dragon Quest never really is, and a cast of colorful characters with an excellent localization bring the world to life in a way Dragon Quest hadn't really been before and the power of the PS2 made it possible to really get across a sense of scale and majesty that was missing from the series before, and seems inseparable from it now. Add in its own version of the tension gauge in the form of buffed stats and sweet finishing moves, and the variation of the alchemy pod focused on upgrading your items, and you can easily see that Dragon Quest VIII made a pretty lasting impression. The Templar Knight Angelo and the Sorceress Jessica also make their way to Dragon Quest Heroes 2 from this game, which is great to see because neither of them really act how you'd expect considering their jobs. And though I missed Yangis from Dragon Quest Heroes 1, these two more than perfectly represent the wonderful flavor of Dragon Quest 8, almost 15 years later right here on the PS4. It's probably the best RPG on the PS2, and that's saying something because there's a ton of good ones out there. And now that it's been re-released on the 3DS, it's probably one of the best RPGs on that one as well. Number four. 
people don't really realize this nowadays, but before the original Dragon Quest got popular back in 1986 and 87, the JRPG as we know it today wasn't really a thing. It's definitely pretty short and simple compared to all the other games on this list, but when creator Yuji Horii tried to find a way to simplify his beloved Western RPGs like Wizardry and Ultima for the Japanese audience, the tropes he established set the standard not only for 30 years of awesome Dragon Quest games, but for the entirety of the JRPG genre. A lot of the things you expect still aren't here. There's only one character, there's no classes, and you have to go all the way back and talk to the king whenever you want to save. But if you're looking for a classic, fun, pure, stripped down version of the JRPG for historical purposes, Dragon Quest is that game. You have to rescue the princess and defeat the Dragon Lord to get back the Ball of Light. But before you do, there's a series of smaller steps you have to follow. And the more you fight monsters, the more experience and money you get to level up with your character and get better gear. Lather, rinse, repeat. Lather, rinse, repeat. Plus, this game only takes a few hours to beat, so why not give it a shot? You know, if not for fun, at least for the history sake of it, to see how it all started, I bet you'll enjoy it more than you think. Normally, I don't recommend this, but the game is so simple, you might even want to buy it for the iPhone. It's only a couple bucks, and in my opinion, this is a game that everyone should play, so check it out! Number 3 Dragon Quest V is in the same second trilogy as Dragon Quest IV, which all sort of have similar geography and revolve around the sky castle Zenithia. But more importantly, this is the second game in the franchise that just completely ignores the linear storytelling and does a kickflip over it. And this time, I think the experiment is even more successful. Rather than focusing on your party members one at a time, Dragon Quest V turns that focus inward toward you, the hero, and you check in with him at three different stages of his life, from childhood to a young man to a father. It really takes the time to flesh out the character, and unlike the tropier main characters of most JRPGs with mysterious pasts, it enables the story to really have some stakes, especially near the end of the journey, when characters pass away. You know so much about what your hero's been through with them over the years, and you really feel his loss. This game came out of left field for me since we never really got it in the West until it came out on the DS in 2008, but I was really impressed not only because of the storytelling, but because Dragon Quest V takes everything new that IV established and ran with it. The wagon and tactic system for your party are back, but with more customization. You can now control your party members manually for the whole game. And like I said earlier, there's about 70 different monsters to tame and have fight for you. I know it's ironic because of the numbering, but if there ever was an Empire Strikes Back of Dragon Quest, Dragon Quest V would be it. And while this game is sometimes overshadowed by previous entries because it's not as totally revolutionary, this is a game where, especially with the DS version, Hand of the Heavenly Bride, you'll find yourself surprised at how good a time you're having. Also, a quick shout out to my waifu Deborah, who I believe to be the one true good choice for the wife in the game. Come at me, haters, that's my opinion. And you know what? Hey, hey, calm down, Raptors, calm down. Sometimes I like to be bossed around. I like to be told what to do. There's too many choices out there nowadays. Number two. I almost feel embarrassed putting such an outlier for the series this high up on the list, but that's only because looking at it now in 2017, there was no way for me to actually show you what it was like to play this game when it first came out. Because here's the thing, if you were actually lucky enough to live in an area where people were actively playing Dragon Quest IX like I was, if you were actually there for those magical few months, this game isn't number two on the list. It's number freaking one, baby, no contest. I know this was the first actual brand new Dragon Quest game on the DS after a bunch of great but kinda old fashioned remakes, but if this game got re-released on the 3DS or the Switch and you could do what you used to be able to do locally except over the internet now, we'd go from normal sized humans to Wally sized humans in about 6 months. I mean are you kidding me? This game had everything! I get that people were upset because it was a main series game that only came out on a portable console, and that it didn't really have playable characters that you didn't make up yourself, but that wasn't really the point. There was a huge class system, there was a pretty basic main quest that still managed to have a fairly interesting plot. 
It was complemented by a bunch of great side quests, and when you were finally finished with those, there were those infinitely generating treasure maps, with completely other monsters to fight, and map exclusive gear to find. Everything was so damn hard, and it was great. But the one thing I'm leaving out is also the best part. Dragon Quest IX came with a local co-op mode where up to three players could hop into your game with their own characters. They could go anywhere you've already explored, and you could beat the story or play dungeons or treasure maps together. But you could also just do whatever you wanted by yourself. And since the game had enemy encounters on the world map like Dragon Quest Joker, you can just call your friends over to help you fight when you needed them. All of this with that classic 80s style turn-based Dragon Quest battle mechanics, and you've got a pretty damn crazy good game here. And now that Dragon Quest Heroes 2 has four-person co-op multiplayer 2, I cannot wait for everyone to start playing so I can go questing with my friends all over again. It even has its own treasure map-like features called the Time Labyrinth, where the more pieces of the map you find in the main story, the more stages you unlock. I hope this is as fun as it seems like it's gonna be, because I really want to go in real hard once it's out. And will somebody please play online with me, please? Deborah's not real and I got no one else. All I got are these really cool dungeons. Number one! I mean, really? Was there any doubt here? If Dragon Quest V is like the Empire Strikes Back of the Dragon Quest series, Dragon Quest III is like the Return of the Jedi. Huge steps forward for the series, epic plot that makes good on the promise of the first two games, and the classic feel that immediately puts this game up there with the Final Fantasy VI's and Breath of Fire's of the world. Even though I've only played this game on a Game Boy Color, Dragon Quest I and II are all about the legend of this ancient hero called Lodo, or Erdrick, or whatever you want him to be called based on whatever versions of the game you played in your life. The games hype this guy up as the greatest hero of all time, and in one of the most simplest yet satisfying creative moves ever to happen in an RPG, Dragon Quest 3 essentially is just like, hey, you know that story we were always talking about with that cool guy who's a mystery but he's the best? Yeah, here's how it happened. Plus, it added in a proper class system for the first time, and unlike Final Fantasy or something, where there's only four classes, Dragon Quest III had eight. That's pretty damn crazy, and it made you want to play the game forever to keep grinding out new skills. And we were so young at the time, we totally had the time to do that. And when you finally beat Baramos, the villain who killed your father and wants to destroy the world, God, it feels great. But just when you thought you were done, a whole other fan servicey area opens up in the game, and your mind is totally blown in a way where you can't even believe there's so much more content in this wonderful game left to check out. And it feels like Christmas or something. When you finally reach the end for real, you really believe that you actually are the legendary hero because of what you achieved. And when a game actually succeeds at doing that, you have to give it props, because that's something that's truly special. So that was my top 10 Dragon Quest games of all time. Let me know what yours are in the comments below, whether they be from the original series or spin-off series. Personally, I have come to love the Dragon Quest series, and I'm so excited that I got to work with Square Enix, who's one of my favorite companies, to bring you guys uh, this really cool video and I hope to do this again sometime soon So if you like this video do me a favor give it a thumbs up comment on it Let Square Enix know that hey, this was a really cool video and we'd love to have them back to do other future types of videos like this um, Dragon Quest Heroes 2 is out today and I have put probably about 40 to 50 hours myself into the game there is cool new class system and online multiplayer, and that to me are the two core elements that are keeping this game so fun and so fresh. I hope you guys like it as much as I do, and that's it. That's all for me. I'll see you all next week. Bye.